If you've ever thought of quilting your own projects but just don't know where to start, I have the perfect first steps for you. I've put together a PDF guide. I call it Three Steps Toward Freehand Freedom. These are the baby steps, but they can help you move past your overwhelm and show you that yes indeed, freehand quilting can be learned. So if you'd like to snag this PDF, There's a link in the show notes, or if you're an Instagram user, just message me three steps. That's the number three, S-T-E-P-S, and I'll send you that link. Let today be the day you get started. Any good actor knows that the person you want to make happy when you are, um, when you're working on a show is always the costume person because you want to look good when you're on stage, right? Because we're all, you know, actors are super vain so um so i went in i think i went in with cookies or donuts or something like that possibly welcome to measure twice cut once the podcast where we hear quilters and other crafter stories and draw encouragement and even life lessons from them Joining me today to tell us his story is Giuseppe Roboto, and you may know him from the quilting world as Juicy Juice. I am your host, Susan Smith. I'm coming to you from my quilting studio, Stitched by Susan. This is where my long arm, Lucy, and I spend our days doing freehand, edge-to-edge quilting. Now, if you're not a quilter and those terms mean nothing to you, it's basically doodling on the surface of a quilt with a 50-pound writing pencil, needle and thread attached at high speed. And if you are a machine quilter, I invite you to tune in to the Live and Unscripted events hosted on my YouTube channel, also called Stitched by Susan. They're held the first and third Friday of every month, and they are, as the title suggests, live. And so they're interactive. You get to see a project usually from beginning to end with all the oopses and decisions and choices included. And you're able to ask questions in real time and get answers about that project while I'm working on it. So I invite you to join me there. Once again, that's on my YouTube channel, Stitched by Susan, the first and third Friday of each month. Today's Pins and Needles is brought to you by The Will and Dave Show. Hi, I'm the Will half of The Will and Dave Show, a short little podcast that Myself and the eponymous Dave like to record talking about the things that really matter to us, whether that's social, political, or pop culture. Usually we don't see eye to eye, but more often than not, we can find some common ground in there somewhere. And now, back to pins and needles with a quick tip for all you sharp filters out there. Today I have a really sharp tip for you. Some of us don't like to talk about our seam rippers because they're kind of our nemesis in our sewing room. But I use my seam rippers for lots and lots of different things, more like a stylus almost than a seam ripper. However, there are days when ripping has just got to be done, and it is so very much easier if you have a sharp seam ripper. So I strongly recommend keeping a second one in your drawer, brand new one, and every so often try that new one, and when you notice a difference and how the two of them work, toss the old one and get out the new one. I personally just use very inexpensive seam rippers. They're not anything fancy, but having a new and sharp one really makes that unpleasant job of ripping so much easier. This podcast is made possible by the support of you, my listener. You know that I love my coffee, so I've chosen an easy way for you to support if you choose. You can simply go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. There for the price of one delicious coffee, you are able to make a one-time contribution. I'm so grateful for your support. And maybe take a moment now to refill your cup as you settle back to enjoy today's interview. Giuseppe Roboto is a man of many talents. His background is in theater, but he's pivoted and now expresses his creativity in fabric and pattern design. But for sure, he brought his love of storytelling and his skills into his fabric lines. And I, for one, can't wait to see what beautiful things are in store for us quilters in the coming weeks. Giuseppe, welcome to my studio. So glad to have you here. Thanks very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm looking forward to getting acquainted a little bit. I'm definitely a fan of your fabrics. I think I was following you already when your first line of fabric came out, and I've always been so enchanted and just excited about seeing the new ones. 
But I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and, you know, kind of what brought you into the world of quilting. Yeah, sure. I So my background is actually in theater. I went to school. Um, I have a BFA in musical theater. Um, like anybody who grew up in New York, I naturally thought that I should move across the country to Seattle to pursue a career in theater. <laughs> so um, I moved out to the, um, I moved out there for this really terrific little conservatory program, really small, intimate um, school called Cornish College of the Arts. And while I was there, I um, one year when I was living in West Seattle, I happened to live across from a um, um, what the heck was that store called? It was a fabric store that's since out of business. It was a, like a not like a Joanne style chain. It was a little bit more independent than that, but it was um, I want to say it was Hancock's. No, it couldn't have been. Is that possible? I don't know. Anyway. Well, I think so. They are on the western side of the country for sure. That's right then. Okay, then that was it. Yeah. For some reason, I was getting it confused with another shop, um, with the uh, the shop in Paducah, which I think is mm, not the okay. same thing. But, I'm um, not sure about that. Same name, but I'm not sure okay. if they're interrelated. Yeah, actually just kind of like weird synaptic misfire. Like it kind of just connected in my brain <laughs> yes. all of a sudden as I was saying it out loud. Um, so anyway, I, I lived across the street from this um, fabric store that I used to go into because they sold a lot of yarn as well. So I'd go in there to, um, I was a knitter at the time. I had just started knitting. So I'd go in there to get some yarn and, you know, needles and things like that when I needed, when I had projects I was working on. And I was always drawn to the quilting section of the shop. My, um, I have a sewing machine at home because I had learned to sew from a really young age from my grandmother. And so, um, you know, I would just like see kind of like the quilts hanging, you know, the displays. And I was just always, I, I was just, I would like feel the fabrics and feel the difference of them. You know, I grew up, like I said, with my grandmother going to fabric shops. So I've always been super tactile. Um, and so I just one day thought I'm going to just gonna buy some fabric and bring it home and cut it up and put, sew it back together and see what happens. And so that is exactly what I did. I went home and uh, my first quilt, it's, it's funny to think about because I don't really do anything particularly improvisational now, but at the time it was pretty much what I was doing. I was cutting up fabric without much meticulousness, if you will, and kind of sewing them back together, seeing what happens. And it kind of just started from there. And then uh, from there, I moved to Milwaukee for a year where I met these um, two lovely gentlemen who worked in the um, in the costume shop. And I, I was I moved to Milwaukee. Um, for, I had uh, gotten a position at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater do, uh, doing acting there for a year. So um, any good actor knows that the person you want to make happy when you are um, when you're working on a show is always the costume person because you want to look good when you're on stage, right? Because we're all act, you know actors are super vain. So, um, so I went in, I think I went in with cookies or donuts or something like that, possibly for them. And there were these two guys there. One was named Ray and one was named Alex and Alex was a knitter and Ray was a quilter. And so I had interest in both of these things and they both sort of, um, wanted to kind of take me under their wing, if you will, kind of mentor me in the craft that I was really interested in. And so it's the only time in my life I've ever had two men fight over me. <laughs> and they were, um, Alex ended up winning, the knitter ended up winning. And the joke was on me because I basically ended up just doing free labor for the costume department. I would like knit the sleeve of a sweater for a costume that they'd have, or I knit, um, I, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. I can't remember the name of the actress, but remember, you, have you seen Moulin Rouge? Yes. You know, the Roxanne, the dance, um, that big, like, you know, the great awesome tango number. Yes. Yes. The, mm -hmm. that the actress who plays the, um, the, the female dancer in that scene, she did a one woman show at the Milwaukee repertory theater. And I can't believe I'm spacing on her name right now, but I knit Me her too. leg warmer. <laughs> yeah. But she's a phenomenal dancer, terrifically talented actress, lovely singer. And, um, I knit her, there's like, um, in the show that they were doing, uh, and it, it's one of her shows, and there's a part where she's like dressed as a cat or something like that. And I knit her leg warmers that were supposed to look like a cat. And she hated them. <laughs> like just absolutely, absolutely hated them. And so um, they got cut from the show. But that was basically what I spent the year doing when I could have been spending time with Ray learning all about quilting. But at the end of the year, I ended up uh, there was um, an auction at the end of the year and Ray would make a quilt that commemorated all of the shows that we'd done that year in the theater, um, at, you know, in, in that repertory year. And it was the first time I'd ever kind of seen a quilt. And 
I use the super, super loosely kind of done the right way where, you know, the pieces were cut just so, and it was quilted really beautifully. It was hand bound and it, it was just a really beautiful piece. And I was really taken with that. I was really, I remember regretting not having learned from him because unfortunately he's since passed. Um, I taught him how to make my family sauce recipe and I can't remember what he taught me, but he taught me something too. It wasn't about quilting, but we like kind of bartered skills. Mm -hmm. And he was a lovely, lovely man and had a wonderful husband. And they were really, they're just really great people. And I have really fond memories of him. But I've, but regardless of whether or not I got to take the time to learn from him, I still kind of credit him with me um, kind of wanting to take my skills in quilting to the next level because I had seen this really beautiful, precise piece that he'd made. Mm -hmm. And so when I moved to Chicago after Milwaukee, um, just a hop, skip and a jump down a couple hours. And I that's when I kind of got serious about quilting. And I started, um, you know, watching a lot more YouTube tutorials and reading books and kind of learning more about it and, you know, learning all about my scant quarter inches and all that good stuff. And that's kind of... Um, there was a, that was a really big shift for me in a lots and lots and lots of things. I became a much more fastidious and meticulous person at that point and just really loved and still to this day loved just getting as much information about quilting as I can. Um, from there, it kind of just started to grow. I joined Instagram, found um, a terrific community of sewists on Instagram started getting sent fabric from fabric companies to do promotional work for them once my kind of uh, following started to grow very, very slowly. And that was kind of it. I was kind of off and running from there. Then um, I got to a point where, while I was living in New York, I mean, I'm sorry, while I was in Chicago, I kind of um, got a little bit burnt out on doing theater. It just wasn't really the, it wasn't really what I thought it would be. I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. And I was really loving quilting. So I thought, I'm going to move back to New York. I'm going to try to get a job at a fabric company. And if that happens, great. And if not, I'm in New York. I audition. My life goes on exactly as planned. And that was kind of how it all happened. I moved to New York. Within a couple of months, I got a job working for Andover Fabrics um, in their marketing department. And then I was kind of off and running from there. And so when I look at your early designs, what's so striking to me is the color, the richness and the depth of color. So did that come, well, where did you come by that love for color? Is that the first thing that struck you when you started making quilts? Is that kind of where your imagination kicks into gear is with the colors? So, you know, it's so different every time. Um, but for the most part, yes, for that particular line, absolutely. So actually, when I first went into Andover to meet with them, it was to pitch them a very early iteration of the fabric collection I wound up releasing three years later. And so that collection was, I didn't have a name at the time. It ended up being Quantum. The designs changed exponentially in that time because I was fortunate enough to get to work with our phenomenal design director, Kathy Hall and learn and soak up so much information in her before she retired and left Andover. So I got to spend a ton of time bugging her. I do mean bugging her because I don't think she loved answering my questions in the beginning. But once she saw that I was truly genuinely interested, she really took to me, I think. And so I learned just so much from her. I learned so much from everybody at Andover because there's so many people there who have just been, the company's 100 years old. And there's so many people who worked there for that. like over 20. Yeah. The, the, so Andover itself started as kind of like a chapter of um, Concord Fabrics. Okay. And then Concord um, basically once David Weinstein, the current um, the current president of the company, when he took over for his father, I hope I'm telling the story correctly. Um, he took over for his father. Then the um, they kind of focused in on Andover, this kind of high end, good like high quality quilting cotton sort of part of the business. And so that was, I don't want to tell you the wrong year. It was a little while ago. I don't want to tell you how long ago that was, but that's kind of where it all started to grow. And um, that's, I mean, that's where Andover came from is what I mean to say. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so those people have, the people who've worked at Andover have worked there since before it was Andover. And so they have just, uh, they, I mean, like Andover, like Concord Fabrics used to make the, um, I believe the apparel for, uh, major league baseball teams back oh, in the day really? there's like a really rich history of mm -hmm. like all the different types of textiles that they worked with at that company yeah it's a really 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 interesting company and the history is really really interesting so 
um, yeah, so I just soaked up as much information as I possibly could. And so, but I knew to get back to your question, I apologize. I went off on a tangent. That's right. Um, the colors for quantum were always the same. So that very early iteration that I showed them of the collection was super, super different than what you, what the collection turned into, but the colors, I always knew for some, I don't know why, but I always knew that particular palette, those like rich gem, that rich gem tone rainbow with like some, you know, odd browns and charcoals and slates in there and some like little weird pops of, of other kind of brighter colors. I always knew that would be the palette of the first group. I just always envisioned it as that, um, I don't know why I couldn't see it as anything other than that. And so for that particular group, the color was very much what drove the collection. But then other ones have been a little bit different. Um, some of them have definitely started with color, but a lot of them have also have started with theme. You know, like Declassified is a collection that I did about the government conspiracy to cover up the existence of extraterrestrials, like anybody would do for Fabric Line. Of course, why not? So, <laughs> great way to tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> naturally. <laughs> And so with that line, um, the, it very much started with the design. And then the colors kind of came from that. When I was trying to think of the colors, I was thinking of kind of lots of 90s sci-fi horror films and things like that. That's kind of where the colors came from or like just like the general, like palettes kind of from my childhood. Like there was a lot of like purple with neon green and things like that. Just like colors that I remember a lot from when, being a kid, like what the toys were like and things like that. So that's where the palette came from for that group. But for that one, design was very much first and color was secondary. Okay. But, it, um, you know, but like my newest collection, Nonna, is kind of an amalgamation of both. Like I knew what I wanted the colors to be because I wanted them to be my colors, but I wanted them to be kind of inspired by my grandmother's colors. Um, but like the design was definitely kind of a big part of that because it was all things that were pulled from her home. So what are, what are some of the things just, in her home that really spoke to you that, that appear in that collection? There's lots of, it's a really, I'm really, really proud of that group. It's very much like uh it was really fun to sit down with her and to like show her the prints for the first time and say, do you know what this is? Do you know was. what this is? Do you know what this is? It was fun. Um, but yeah, so basically the main floral is the floral from her couch, which when I was a child was covered in plastic, like any good Italian family would have their couch. <laughs> um, it's uh, since been reupholstered. I wish I, what I really wanted to do for that main floral was find the original upholstery from when I was a kid, but unfortunately that fabric's long gone. Um, so, um, we, uh, so there's the floral from the couch. One of my favorite prints in the group is from a dessert plate that got pulled out only on special occasions. Whenever we were having like a good dessert from the Sicilian bakery down the street, that's when these plates got pulled out. And okay. so it's this really, yeah, like this little pretty floral, um, a little wreath kind of floral pattern in the center. And then there were these little tiny bouquets of flowers in the corners. And those little bouquets became another print in the collection. There's the caning from her chair, which is like super popular again, because I mean, you know, fashion design, all of it is cyclical. What right? a great texture though. I love that. It's nice. It's such a, I mean, it's yeah. a inherently geometric, right? It's like, so it's like, it does the work itself. I mean, you know, it took a photo of it and put it like, it's all, that's all it took to design that one, you know? Um, and then what else is there? There's the tweed from her awesome 70s speakers. She has these great like record player 70s speaker thing that's still right there when you walk into the house and it's lined in this gorgeous, like yellow chartreuse and brown and charcoal tweed. Oh, it's so good. And so I pulled the tweed print from there. There's um, a stripe for my grandfather who always wore striped shirts and striped pajamas, who's passed away. There's um, a, there's a suits from uh, decks of cards because my family are big poker players. I wanted to do something that was, I'm not a poker player or a card player, but, a, but a, my cousins, that was like a big thing that they shared with my grandfather and my grandmother. So I wanted to pay homage to that. So there's um, kind of a Juicy Juice style geometric suits, um, like for decks of cards in there too. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I think that's, oh, and then there's the lamp. Her, she's these awesome, like, they're like these weird, like, it's like a shepherd and a shepherd girl who, ha and there's like a Moroccan lamp on top of it. It's like the weirdest lamps in the world. And they're so cool. So I got to use the Moroccan lamp part of that print. There's lots of, there's lots of cool stuff. She's so much interesting stuff. That's it's a like crazy such a amount time of capsule. storytelling in one fabric collection. That That's crazy. It's the first line they've ever done that has where every single print is like there was nothing extraneous. Every single print has a very, very specific uh, story attached to it and memory attached to it. So that is your most current line, but it has already been released right into into shops. 
Yeah, Anona came out the end of summer, like October ish of last year. I have, um, and then uh, my most recent collection is actually called Fabric from the Attic, which is small geometric prints that kind of blend into Nonna and will be a bridge to next collections as well. It has kind of like a 70s, like the idea is that you move into this great big beautiful house from the 70s, you go up in the attic and there was a quilter who lived there before you and there's this treasure chest of fabric that they left behind and um, all of the fabrics that were found in that little chest of wonders. I love that idea. I recently Thanks. been kind of binge watching. Um, of course, now the name is going to escape me. Oh, no. Escape to the Chateau, which is about a, a, oh, a British yeah. expat family that's refurbishing a castle in France. So they keep doing the same thing. They keep finding these little bits of wallpaper in, you know, behind stairwells and in the attic and recreating them, too. And I absolutely love that idea. Um yeah, so I just cool. love my that friend Daryl has been telling me about that show. It sounds so neat and like right up my alley. I really have to watch it. I think you'd enjoy it. The family is a lot of fun. They're just super people, so it's not awkward, and weird to watch. It's just it's really fun to watch their family grow and their castle, of course, because who doesn't want a With chateau that. in France? <laughs> right. <laughs> so you mentioned just really briefly in passing, you were talking about when you were getting. Um, kind of weary of working in theater and then you moved into, you know, transitioning into quilts and fabrics and so forth. And I wonder, does that kind of thing happen to you now that quilting and fabric design has become your job and not just your joy and hobby? Do you find there are times when you have kind of a slump in creativity and how do you work around that? Yeah, I, so yes and no. I really feel like I found, it's weird to think about because like, I mean, like I did theater I started doing theater when I was eight years old and did that until I was like really seri like seriously committed everything to it to for probably like 20 years or so. So it's a weird thing to think that like I made such a 180 with what it turned into. But I really think that all of that, like the learning about being a creative person, and, like discovering my creativity through theater, um, all of those things um, all kind of led me to what I'm doing now. I really do feel that I've found my purpose, you know, and the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. That doesn't mean, though, that there aren't times where it's really hard to get to work, you know. Um, I have more, I get it more with sewing, not with so much with designing. When I have like a design deadline, it's pretty easy for me to hunker down and do the work. So that, that's the thing that I really feel like I've been really waiting to do for a long time. There's like just... Because again, like when I went to Andover, I was ready to become a designer. Like that was what I was hoping my relationship with them would be. And then that got put on the back burner for a couple of years because I was offered a job actually working at the company. But there's like just such a backlog of ideas in there. Um, and that kind of creativity is, I feel like, where I really thrive in the, okay. because I'm, I'm not a designer by, I'm not, I mean, like, again, like I went to school for theater, like I don't have. I didn't grow up drawing. I didn't grow up designing. I didn't go to, I didn't get a formal education in design, but what I am really good at is being creative. And mm -hmm. so when I have, get an idea, the, the fun part is figuring out how can I make that happen? So that part I have not tired of the sewing though. That was something I didn't think would happen to me. And it definitely I've had moments where it's just really hard to sit and sew. Um, because it is like, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it, it's the warning that, that everybody gets when they're fortunate enough. And I, I want to emphasize how fortunate I am to get to do my job. Um, I have no qualms with my work whatsoever. I love what I do. But it is really hard that, like, I mean, every moment of every single day of my life is consumed with mm -hmm. this thing that is like, it's my livelihood, literally. It's um, the only thing I think about. It's everywhere in my house. It's you know, I mean, there's always at any given moment, 30 emails in my inbox to answer questions about it and things like that. And again, that I'm not complaining about any of that, but it's hard when the thing that was something that at one point just brought you joy becomes something that is now a responsibility. That's, yes, you now you know, have some obligations toward it. Mm -hmm. There's obligation toward it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a fun, love and good time anymore. It is still that, but it's mm -hmm. also work, you know? <laughs> yep. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So I find that when I do get into those creative slumps, um, sometimes I feel like a creative slump is nothing more than just your 
brain resetting so that it's ready to do the next thing. I think the worst thing that you can do when you're in some kind of a slump is judge yourself for it and beat yourself up for it and feel bad that you're not being more productive and all of those things, because none of those things will actually help to get you back to work. Um, the right, you know, the best thing that you can do when you're in a slump um, is I think, I mean, it can show itself in lots of ways. I mean, what I try to do is focus on the successes I have had, going back and looking at other work that I've, other quilts that I've made, like digging something out that I haven't seen in a while or doing, you know, I mean, you hear this one a lot, doing something like a small project, like something that had brought me joy in the past, doing a new version of it or something like that. I have these little, like these mini series blocks that I have. Um, they're really tiny little, um, tiny piecing little blocks. So that's like a really, you know, that's like a couple hours it takes me to bust out one or two of those. Like that's like a nice way to kind of get the juices flowing without having much of a commitment of it's, what, it's almost a palate you know. cleanser, isn't it? Just to kind yeah, of sweep yeah. away what you've been doing and logged into and then just do something fresh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, the worst thing that you can do when you're in a creative slump is judge yourself for it. Like you need, you, nobody can be prolific and creative every moment of every single day of their life. I mean, that's how you end up with like, you know, singers who are like, who are completely aged out of the industry who keep getting, whatever plastic surgery done, trying to stay relevant, trying to do it instead of like, take a step back and think of what you can do now to be different. Mm -hmm. Like you already made your indelible mark on culture or whatever it was that you did. Like take a breather, make some room for new people and then come back once you've assessed and try something different and try something new, you know? That, that's a that's really good I point. It. I feel like the creative arts, maybe that affects us more. There, you know, there are times in your life and situations where you just need to do the thing that needs doing. But when you're wanting to be creative and have fresh ideas, you have to step back. You have to take breaks, I feel like, do other things. Mm -hmm. And no amount of pushing yourself through them is going to make creativity happen. It's really critical to give yourself that grace. Yeah, absolutely. When I was doing theater, I had one teacher who, and this, I, I agreed with many of the things that he would say, but whenever we were having a tough moment in a scene, he would always say, push through it. We're not taking a break. We're going to push through it. We're going to push through it. We're going to push through it. For me, it never really worked. I never really felt like I got there when I was just like trying to force it, trying to force it, trying to force it. Never, maybe every once in a while it did work. But for the most part, like sometimes you need to just take a step back and think, ponder, wonder, you know, and then that's where newness is born, I think. You know, I agree. That's often where the magic happens is when you're thinking about something totally different, doing something totally different, and you're sort of subconscious all of a sudden birth something brand new. Yeah, that's the shower principle, I think. Yeah, I think that's what What's it's the called. Shower the shower principle? principle. I didn't know well, so there I don't was know a word for it. <laughs> I don't know if it's a real thing. It's something I think I heard on 30 Rock, but I don't know if it's real or if it's just something they made up for the show. I've never actually bothered to look it Either up. Either way, if it but works. If, if it works, though, it makes sense. It's the idea that when you're struggling to come up with that next great idea, that if you like, if you take a step back and stop focusing on that thing and do something else, exactly what you just said, for instance, go take a shower, take a bath, do something else and just focus on that, then it can clear your mind. And that's where new ideas can kind of enter into your brain a little bit because you're stopped. Because that's the thing, we get tunnel vision sometimes with as creative people, like, you know, I feel like you end up like when you're like if you're trying to come up with something new, like you're going through a Rolodex of other things that you've done and this, that and the other thing. And it's just so noisy in your head, you know. You need to um, you need to distract yourself for a moment, forget about it all for a minute, and then there's room for because the ideas are in there. You're one, if a creative person is always a creative person. Mm -hmm. You don't stop being a creative person, you know. So I think yeah, the shower principle. I, again, I don't know if it's real, but I like it. It, it, it I think it makes sense. <laughs> it's working. It's working. Yeah. <laughs> so you've dropped a whole bunch of nuggets into the last few minutes. My goodness. <laughs> But before we go, I always like to ask my guests if you have something in particular that you'd like to share with our listeners, that a little piece of wisdom that they can take forward into their creative journey. Hmm, I think that just no matter what you do, no matter what you, this is something I've been struggling with and I'm trying to remind myself of more and more these days is not to judge what I'm doing based on what other people are doing to really try as hard as you can to stay true to what it is that you want to do, your message, your, um, you know, whatever it is that is kind of, that drives you and makes you happy. 
to, you know, I mean, like we, we all do it. We all compare ourselves like comparison is the thief of joy. Right. So we all like see somebody else who has whatever it is, a similar following to us or somebody who has a pattern that's this or somebody that has a whatever that's that. And it's super easy to let it bother us. And, but instead, like, it's just such a waste of time to do that. Like just, you know, and what I'm talking about more is like the, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this, like that feeling like you're less than because you didn't come up with that thing or that, that mm-hmm. you think that their thing is better than yours, or whatever that voice is in your head that nags at you and makes you feel like you're not good enough. Tell that person, just shut the heck up and just do your thing and persevere and try. And you're never going to make everybody happy. You're never going to, you're never going to make something that everybody's going to like. And but the also there's room do, for all the creativity in the world, isn't there? That's the thing. Like, like the, the, the thing to focus on is just like that idea that like your creativity will re- will resonate with somebody else somewhere. And that's the person that you should be doing it for, not the people who make you feel like, you know, like you're not doing enough or you're, you know, you should be working more. You should be doing this more. You should be doing that. We can all only do the most that we can do the best that we can do. Mm-hmm. And um, no amount of comparing yourself to another person is going to make that any easier or better. So yeah, like, and just enjoy it as much as you can. Like if you're fortunate enough to be in a position like I am, where you get to call this part of your work, especially like, you know, relish in that and appreciate it and find joy in it. And I mean, if you do that, then, it's always it's a job, but it's never really a job, you know. It's a job, but it's not a chore, I guess, kind of thing. That's a good way to put it. It is still a job, but it can be a joy at the same time. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much for joining me. What a treat! And I look yeah, forward to your new collections. You have a new one fairly soon on the horizon. Yes, you alluded yeah. to it briefly. Fabric from the Attic just shipped um, shipped at the end of December, starting to kind of trickle into stores uh, now as well. And Perfect. then I have a collection coming out this month called uh, Wallflower, which is a collection of neutrals. Oh, my goodness. That is two in quick succession. Wow. Go you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I will link to all of those things in the show notes for our listeners. And thanks again for joining me. Thanks for having me. And thank you, listeners and friends, for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcast or the listening app of your choice? And do share this episode with your friends as well. It really helps other listeners to find the show so they can enjoy these stories too. Plus, I'd love to hear from listeners who'd like to nominate a crafter with a story to tell. If you know such a person, email me at info at stitchedbysusan.com. And don't forget to CC the nominee as well. So until next time... May your sorrows be patched and your joys be quilted. <laughs>